We are Red and April Off-Grid. Thanks for joining us. We are building a completely DIY off-the-grid home in the beautiful but extreme Arizona desert. Red is going to start out by talking about our home orientation and how the house is performing as the outside temperatures are starting to heat up. We have exposed metal beams and currently only two inches of insulation board under the metal siding on the exterior of the house. After talking about temperatures, we'll show you what else we have been up to. Be sure to subscribe and give us a thumbs up to follow our off-grid home building and other adventures. So a little about our climate. So last summer, the highest temperature we recorded was about 105 degrees. June is typically the hottest month, and once the monsoon rains begin in July, we should cool back down into the 80s. Well, it's a hot day in late May here in Arizona. It's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's up at about just a little over 95 degrees today. And we just got out of our RV. It's a lot cooler in there. We have a, an evaporative cooler going. And it's pretty comfortable in there, although still pretty warm. And we're about to go check out the house and see how it's doing. So here's something interesting. So we're on the side of our house. This has been exposed to direct sun. It's indirect sun right now. And I want to show you the temperature difference between white and a color. So start on the color. It's 150 degrees on that color. All I have to do is move over here to the white. 125 degrees. And so that's why we used white on our roof is because it's going to be catching the most sun and it's it just stays way cooler. It reflects way more of that heat. So an incredible 25 degree difference between the white and the colored metal. So part of our energy efficient home design was the design where the front of the house is in shade during the hottest part of the day. So we're out here at four o'clock in late May. The sun is kind of starting to go down, starting to set a little bit or go down in the sky. And so this is the west side of the house. And so it's in direct sun right now and it's quite hot. So the siding is at about 151. This white part here is much cooler at 127. But we turn the corner and go to the south side. You can see this entire side of the house is in the shade now. Sun isn't hitting any of the south side directly. All of our big windows are protected in shade. And look at the temperature differential. So this was 150 on this side in the direct sun. Over here, 101 degrees. 50 degrees difference between being in the shade and being in the sun. And here we are on the, the shady side, the south side again, and just to show you, this shade is really effective. So, you know, it's about 90, 95, 96 degrees outside right now. It's 96.8 on the exterior of the house. So being in shade is basically keeps it down to ambient temperature. That Just keeping that sun off of the wall makes a huge, huge difference in the amount of heat that the house absorbs and how much transfers to the inside. So now we're inside the house and it's same as four o'clock in the afternoon. We've had the door front door open some today, so it might have been a little bit cooler if we hadn't have been working in here most of the day, but it's 96 degrees outside. And right now the interior temperature is just a little over 81 degrees. So we're still 15 degrees cooler than outside, even without any air conditioning or anything. And that's with having the front door open, which was letting some of the cool air out. One thing that's really awesome is you'll notice that our high, the highest we've seen here is 81 degrees, and the lowest we've seen at night was 66 degrees. That's only a 15 degree difference between the daytime high and the nighttime low. Now, if you compare that with the outside temperature, we've been getting down to into the 40s at night and up into the mid 90s at night. We've actually seen a 55 degree span between day high and the nighttime low. So a 55 degree span outside, and in here we only have a 15 degree span. And we're seeing this incredible heat difference with only the foam insulation on the exterior. We still have all the batting insulation to put in place, still have a lot more isolated thermal mass to bring in, so it's only going to get better and hopefully a lot better, but it's really all already incredibly good in here. So we wanted to check and see what this beam was doing temperature-wise. So the sun is right now is shining on this side of the house. It's the western side. The sun's beating on this outside of the wall. And I wanted to check and see if this beam was getting hotter than the surrounding wood. And so if I take a shot of the temperature of the sheeting here, I'm at 91 degrees. And if I go up to this metal beam, it's actually cooler. It's 88 degrees. So it's definitely not absorbing more heat. It's actually cooler than the sheeting right here, which I think is remarkable. Also of note, because of our overhangs and orientation, the beams get very little sun, even in the late evening. 
and I fit insulation inside the C channel. We also covered the beams with two inches of rigid foam board. This beam actually extends outside the house. There's sticks out four feet with that overhang. And I wanted to see if that beam was getting hot since it's on the end of the house, absorbing that afternoon sun. And I'm pointing up there right now. I'm getting 90 degrees on the beam just before it exits the house. And the sheeting nearby is 91. The beam is still, yeah, the beam is still one degree cooler than the sheeting, or at least the same. So it's, there's basically no noticeable difference. It's definitely not hotter. So we're not right now picking up heat from the outside and bringing it inside the house, which is awesome. So I wanted to show you how this concrete wall is doing. And I wondered, we wondered if there was a temperature differential between the concrete wall and the outside sheeting. So this is the shady side of the house. This side of the house right now isn't receiving any direct sun. And so you'd think that the concrete wall would be pretty similar in temperature. So let's shoot the concrete wall here. We're getting 79 degrees on the concrete wall and the sheeting on the shady side is 85. So we have a six degree difference. The concrete wall right now is six degrees cooler than the sheeting on this exterior wall, which there again is in, is in shade right now. So it's it's protected. Right now, this concrete is acting like a heat sink and soaking up the extra heat in the house. And so it's doing just what thermal mass should, it's bringing that high temperature down during the day, and then it'll bring the low temperature up at night. An important part of our passive thermal control design is the southward orientation of the house and the precisely calculated eaves. The eaves cast more and more of the south face of the house in shadow as the warmer months progress, as you can see in these pictures. These beams are protruding and they're already starting to cast a shadow, and so we've seen that shadow progressing down the face, the southward face of the house as the months progress. It was interesting to see in real time. It progressed faster than we intuitively thought. It's already progressed a good ways down the house here, just in early to mid-March. And then it really started going blazing fast in the March-April time frame. This was taken around April 1st, and you, as you can see, the shade is already down almost to the very bottom of the windows. And by the middle of April, it's completely covering the south side of the house. It's also interesting that on the north face of the house, the back of the house, we originally didn't expect it to get any sun. But it turns out we do get some direct sun, but it's only in the evening, kind of the late evening sun. Uh, does hit the north side of the house. At least it did when this was taken in May. And now back to the home build. I decided to work on the guest bathroom and starting on the toilet here. So I had this four inch line stubbed up for the toilet and I'm just removing the foam out from around the base here. And that actually worked out really well. I had put that foam there to protect it from the concrete. And when I removed it, it created a gap around this pipe, which was big enough for me to get the flange for the toilet flange down in there. So I'm cutting it off flush using a saw. And then I use this really cool tool that goes in my drill that allows me to go inside the pipe and cut it from the inside. It's a really neat tool. That allowed me to cut the pipe off flush just below the surface of the concrete. My next step is to install the flange, and so that'll be a glued fitting, and it'll be glued on the outside of the pipe coming up, and the inside of this flange piece. So I, I glued that on, mounted it in place there, and then the next step was to actually anchor it to the concrete floor. And to do that, I used my hammer drill and a masonry bit in order to pre-drill the holes for the screws that'll actually attach it. That took a long time. It was really hard drilling, and I struggled with that for a good bit of time. Uh, the hammer drill wasn't working very well. So anyway, I finally got through and got enough screws in to hold it in place. We decided to use the toilet from our outhouse and just put it in the guest bathroom. So I had to remove that from the outhouse and kind of get it cleaned up and ready to mount on the inside. Once that was prepped, I put on the wax ring and bolts and carried it inside. Installing a toilet's pretty easy. You just set it down over the wax ring and then press it carefully into place and then use those two bolts to kind of bring it down to the floor and hold it in place. I try to always tighten these down slowly and work back and forth side to side so that you, you can actually break the porcelain if you're not careful uh, or deform the wax ring. So just work it down slowly until you make good contact. The next thing was to make the connection to the water line and I had a piece of PEX stubbed up for that. So I just reused the old flex line and made that connection real quick. It was really easy. 
A little more difficult actually was figuring out which line from the manifold feeds that line to the toilet. I, I didn't label these originally and so I wasn't quite sure which line I actually ran to the toilet, which line went where. They're all closed and there's water in that header so I don't want to just start turning things on or water will spray everywhere. So I ended up looking on my phone, looking at some past pictures and trying to figure out which ones I had ran where. I finally did find a picture that was pretty informative and was able to determine which one it was. So I, we turned that, opened it up and got water going to the toilet and everything worked good. Next I dug up and disconnected the drain line from the outhouse and reinstalled the service riser. With that done, we're ready to actually move this shed. As you can see here, I'm removing these really long stakes that I had holding this down. They go through the runners on the bottom of the building and they were going down probably a good three feet into the ground. I had it really well secured because at the time, you know, there wasn't a house there and there were strong winds that were whipping across here that we had in the winter time. And so I had it really staked down. I had sandbags over these little outriggers that I had put onto it to keep it from blowing over in the wind. That was a huge concern. I was terrified it was gonna blow over and rip out the plumbing that it was connected to and be a huge mess. So anyway, I kind of went a little overboard, staked it down in all four corners, put in these outriggers with these bags and I'm glad we're done with this shed here and we're ready to move it so it's it's a pleasure here to be deconstructing all this there's a huge pile of bags we got all the stakes out and we're starting to move it april and i were able to both team up and move it one side and then the other just to scoot it out of the way so i could do more work on the plumbing here i've disconnected it and every, all that is put back on the septic end but also coming out in the same location is our gray water system and it was just terminated and capped here and I wanted to make the gray water system usable. I'm not going to finish the gray water system now, but I did want to make it temporarily usable. And that entails bringing it out a little ways away from the house so that we can start using it, at least for now. We want to be able to connect the sink and start using this gray water system. So that entails just getting it away from the house a little ways. And now was a good time to do it. So we got started, but we didn't have all the supplies we needed. We were kind of limited with what we had on hand. And so this is just a very temporary fix and really we we're still trying to figure out what we wanted to do long term with the gray water system exactly where we wanted to run it and what we wanted it to water and so anyway we we're struggling a little bit to figure out what we wanted to do we eventually settled on just bringing it out around the porch a little ways and then create a little protected rock bed for it to empty into this will work for now I'm, we're backfilling it so at least we won't have to come back and redo this part it is at least headed in the right direction we plan to eventually run it further off and it'll actually water some shrubs trees bushes that sort of thing it'll be really useful but this will get it to a temporary useful condition for now this line is actually quite shallow and intentionally so and the reason for that is because the gray water system is all gravity fed so it needs to be able to just by the force of gravity migrate out to wherever you want it to be and so we had to really take elevations into account and so I think this is going to work out perfect where the direction we're running it to is all downhill from here slightly and so we'll be able to use gravity to take it onto those trees and bushes that we want to water. Really looking forward to getting this shed out of here. It's been up next to the house. We've been working around it and great to finally move it. We had some of our kids happen to be around and we asked them to help us move it. So we hooked some ropes onto it and just pulled it out of the way. It was a bit of a struggle and the skids do allow us to slide it across the ground fairly easily. I also moved the sink from the temporary bathroom into the guest bedroom, also in a very temporary manner. And we got in our drywall and we're ready to get started on that. April's been working on the insulation, which also came in with the order. She's been busily working on that, started in the bathroom. Here I am, I'm working on a couple exterior lights. We picked up some dark night sky lights that, that don't uh, spread too much light up into the sky, kind of keep the light pollution down. Those will be our exterior lights and I'm ins installing those now. Those were a pretty quick install. I did the backlight first and I'm moving to the front of the house using identical lights in both locations. As we mentioned in our last video, we've been working on drywall in conjunction with the poured concrete walls. We decided to start in the guest bathroom and in the pantry, so that corner of the house. 
April is focusing on the insulation, which is a huge help. She does a great job at that. And so I kind of follow her as she's doing the insulation and drywall in behind her. You can see me, I'm working on the drywall in the back wall where the tub will be actually. It's kind of that area, that window is right over the tub area. So we're getting that insulated and drywalled. The insulation that we're putting in here is 10 inch thick insulation. It has an R value of 30. And so that combined with the foam on the roof that we've already added will give us about an R40 in the roof, which is not tremendous, but due to the way it's designed without having any thermal bridging, it's actually a really well built roof and we're really happy with the R value it has. But anyway, these thick pieces are a little bit difficult to get in between the beams. April has to work at it to get them in a little bit. Fortunately, they do come in four foot wide bats, which worked well to get in between those metal beams, which are on four foot centers. While she's working on that, I'm putting up the drywall. The drywall for the bathroom is this purple drywall, and it's, it's purple because it's a mold and mildew resistant drywall that's recommended for bathroom use. Here's a little footage of us working on the pantry, which is right there by the bathroom. We didn't have our overhead lift yet. We ordered one, but it hadn't come in yet. And this is a pretty tight space for it anyway, but we're working on that overhead piece. Always difficult, always challenging. Put it up once, didn't fit. Had to take it down and cut it. Put it up again and then realized that I didn't cut out the hole for the light fixture, the, the light socket. So take it down again, remeasure, cut that hole. Ah, the joys of sheetrock. But we finally got the hole in, got it in the right place. With April's help, we were able to hold it up in place and get those screws in. Uh, I hate to imagine having to do this whole house uh, like this without the lift. I'm really hoping that lift makes it easier because it's just brutal having to get help and hold a piece up until you can get a few screws in. It can really be a challenge. Well, we got the drywall done in the pantry and then got the first coat of mud on. Usually takes me about two coats or two applications to get it correct and I'm about to start sanding on that first coat of mud. This is the the hardest part of the job, always a good physical workout and pretty messy. We decided to go ahead and finish out the pantry first. We don't have any really good place for food storage and it would be nice to have that. Our shipping containers are a little bit warm in the summertime for that and our RV is a little bit small so we thought well let's get this space finished out and we can start cool food storage in here because this place is staying really nice and cool. So that's why we're focusing on finishing out the pantry first. Finished sanding that and now it's back to hanging more drywall. This is always a multi-step process doing drywall. You, you put up some drywall, then you'll move to mud, another room, and then while that's drying you'll go back to hanging, then you'll go back and sand that one, and then go back to mudding another area. So at least the way I do it, I'm always moving back and forth between different rooms with different rooms being in, in different states of progress. And in the meantime, April has been out here pretty much full time working on insulation and trying to stay ahead of me with the drywall on the insulation. The insulation itself is just a huge project and it's taken up a lot of her time. So happy that she's helping with that. It's a huge task. We're excited to be working on this part of the project, but we can tell it's definitely going to take a while. We had some family over one more time to help us to move the shed into its permanent home. Here you can see the pads that we poured for it when we were doing the concrete wall. And I put some outriggers on this so that everyone could grab a corner and we muscled it into place. It's now sitting where it will be permanently. Very exciting. This shed will now be used as a shelter for our propane bottles and as a garden shed. So here is a quick current look at the garden. Today is June 2nd. The beans are getting attacked by the leaf cutter bees, but last year they got to them but didn't kill them, so I think they'll be okay. Getting a few aphids, having to try to keep those under control. The squash are doing well, starting to climb the trellis, butternut and spaghetti. Potatoes, pepper, tomato and squash are doing well. Lots of these purple butterfly like we had last year, they're just everywhere. They're attracted to the water, but didn't seem to hurt anything. Tomato and squash are doing well. I read that lizards will eat squash bugs. I have seen a few, and they can really take over, so I'm hoping the lizards will keep them under control. There's usually several lizards under the squash plants, so... Starting to get some little zucchinis coming on. And then over here is the okra. They're just super slow growing, but they're starting to make a little progress. I took all the plastic covers off 
and replaced them with these covers that I had over the squash plants. Cucumber are slowly growing, zucchini, cantaloupe. So as far as the buzzer doing its job, I did get a groundhog in the compost bin. So I was able to get rid of it and it hasn't come back. I haven't had any more in here. The repeller is not perfect, but I'm still hoping it's somewhat effective and will at least be a deterrent. So we seem to have a lot of cicadas this year, so I've got my Palo Verde all wrapped up. Uh, the cicadas can lay eggs in the thin branches of the trees and kill them. So just thought I'd put a netting over that and hopefully keep them away from it. And my fire thorn has a little something going on with it. I don't know if I'm overwatering it or what's going on. So, so I learned that English ivy does not like full sun. So I wish I had read that. It also likes humidity. So I noticed it was looking kind of sunburned. So I put some netting around it. So not ideal since I wanted to use it in full sun to shade the end of the container. So, so we'll see how it does. This is some kind of native vine that has some kind of melons on it that I transplanted last year. So at least we have something growing up the container. So it's about a week later now. It's June 10th. As you can see, things have really grown. We got a little bit of rain last night. If you enjoy our content, be sure to like and subscribe and give us a thumbs up.